We'll start our second time together tonight, and uh, just as an announcement, all times announced are in lower registered time. So keep that in mind. So it's in real earthly time. So we're going to start again, and we're going to start by grabbing our hymnal and turning to hymn 122. And if you stand, we're going to sing hymn 100, <clears throat> excuse me, 122, if you're able, standing, please. <clears throat> talk to us tonight. Thank you. Um, on behalf of Presbyterian Missionary Union, I'm really grateful to Western Reform Seminary for this ministry, this lecture series, and also the opportunity uh, for Presbyterian Missionary Union to be uh, here as well, to be represented. Um, I think it can be said that WRS has that goal of preparing leaders for the work of the ministry, and it is PMU's goal to send them to the ends of the earth and, uh, and to support them in that work, but not only to the ends of the earth, 
but in home missions and labors for God's kingdom as well. Uh, the Bible tells us to declare the glory of God to the nations, and that is what we do together. Uh, not only does PMU work to support and, uh, and initiate those works and, and give men who are called the opportunity to exercise their calling throughout God's kingdom, throughout God's earth, but also give you opportunity in being a part of that work. And so um, we have a table out there. We'd love to get to chat with you. It's great to see many of you who have been serving the Lord here in your local uh, context, but also with us in missions in various places in the, in the United States and even around the world. So uh, if you have a few minutes, we'd love to chat with you and give you more information about how you can be part of that work of expanding the Lord's glory and his kingdom around the world. Thank you. Is that two minutes less? Yes. Or two? All right. <laughs> we'll turn back to Dr. Gibson. So if the first lecture was instructive, giving you the two essential elements of the literary framework, non-literal, non-sequential, giving you the three arguments, the two triads matching days one to three with days four to five, the ordinary providence from Genesis 2, five to six, and the two register cosmogony of heaven and earth in space and time. Uh, if the first lecture was instructive, this one is deconstructive. We're going to now critically engage the literary framework interpretation for this lecture and also for the third lecture tomorrow evening. I've got five main concerns in the critical engagement with the literary framework interpretation. Three this evening, two tomorrow night in the third lecture. Here's the first one. It is highly sophisticated Hands up who find it highly sophisticated. Okay. Um, for a number of reasons, the interpretation requires an in-depth knowledge of several areas related to the hermeneutical task. You've got to know what an inverted chiastic parallelism is, what re temporal recapitulation is, how a metaphor works, uh, how something can be non-sequential but a wee bit sequential, um, things like that. Okay. It, involves a high level of sophistication for that reason. Also, uh, there's the anachronistic approach from the time scale of the normal reader. You read Genesis 1 through the lens of Genesis 2. You read Genesis 1, you think it plainly teaches a normal chronological order of the creation week. You get to chapter 2 and you realize you completely misread chapter 1. So you have to go back in light of chapter 2 and reread chapter 1 in a non-chronological order, even though the text is actually communicated to you in a chronological order. It doesn't say day one, day two, day three. It says the first day, the second day, the third day. Okay? And so the problem here is you have to employ what I call the anachronistic hermeneutic. You read scripture back to front, okay? which is a strange way to read the first two chapters of a book. The third reason it's highly sophisticated is this two-register cosmogony. Now, as I said, I will present in my fourth lecture uh, a presentation of how to read the Genesis prologue that includes the two-register cosmogony. I don't think Klein is wrong there. Uh, but to make you know, the interpretation of Genesis 1 sort of dependent upon it, uh, I think adds to the uh, sophistication. And what this does then, if the literary framework interpretation is correct, what it does is it basically makes the opening chapter of the Christian scriptures uh, unknowable for the vast majority of the Christian church in the world. Because the vast majority of the Christian church in the world are uneducated, illiterate. The majority of the Christian church in the world today is in Africa and South America where there is high levels of illiteracy and low levels of education. Are we really to believe that the opening chapter of the Bible uh, is inaccessible for the vast majority of the Christian church? 
Now, this doesn't mean there's, there's nothing profound about the Bible or even the opening chapter or anything like that, but I think it is not a little strange that God, by Moses, by his Spirit, would inspire the opening chapter to be so complex uh, of the Christian scriptures. So that's the first concern, too highly sophisticated. Second, it leads naturally from the first, is it's historically peculiar and novel. Even though Irons and Klein claim Augustine held to this figurative interpretation, or at least sowed the seeds for it, uh, Augustine's presentation was nothing like the, f the literary framework interpretation. That means that the first iteration of this view, if it is the correct inspired view by the the, the intended interpretation by the Holy Spirit, then it first arose in the Christian church in 1924 by a, du a Dutchman called Ari Nurza. And then it lay dormant for 30 years until it was translated by N.H. Ritterboss. And then it needed to come into English a few years after that. And then only in 1958 did Meredith Klein really put his finger on what the Spirit intended in this interpretation. And then... 40 years later, he clarified again and expanded. And so only in the 21st century, when Lee Irons and Meredith Klein in 2001 give us the most mature presentation of the literary framework, have we finally grasped what the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to write thousands of years ago. It is historically peculiar and novel, the interpretation. One of the things I tell my students at Westminster Theological Seminary is the importance of historic precedence in interpreting the Bible. One of the reasons why you study church history at seminary is it's the history of the interpretation of the Word of God. And Spurgeon said, if you ever come up with an interpretation of a text that nobody else has ever thought of in the history of the church, it's wrong. Right? Because there's no precedence for it. Okay? Um, and so I would argue the same with the literary historical, the literary framework interpretation. It, it lacks historic precedence. It's peculiar and novel. Okay, the third concern, and this is the one I'm going to spend the rest of our time on this evening, is it is exegetically inaccurate and inconsistent. Exegetically inaccurate and inconsistent. <clears throat> and I have five uh, aspects under this third point, five aspects. Number one, the proposal for a literary framework consisting of an inverted chiastic parallelism matching days one to three to days four to six is not as neat and tidy as Irons and Klein present. When you carefully analyze it, the language of kingdoms and kings tends more toward eisegesis than exegesis. The idea of light, sky, sea, and land, each being their own kingdom, is nowhere stated in the prologue. And the idea of creature kings may work for the sun and the moon. It does not work for the other creatures. Uh, the verbs to um, rule, to have dominion, to subdue, three verbs in the Hebrew, um, rada, mashal, kavash, uh, they are never employed of birds and fish and animals anywhere in Scripture. Birds never rule anything. Fish never rule anything. Animals never rule anything. They're all rulees. They're all ruled by man. Man's the only ruler. So this idea of these kings that rule these kingdoms uh, is more creative than persuasive. Um, and also the inverted parallelism, if you remember it from days two to five, Irons and Klein say that there's this inverted parallelism, the sky is mentioned first, then the seas, and then the fish are mentioned first, and then the birds, and so you have this inverted chiasm. Well, it doesn't quite match because the seas, technically, strictly speaking, are not made until day three. On day two, you have the waters. But the seas are only formed on day three. So now day five doesn't match day two. Day five matches day three, which sort of knocks your literary framework uh, scheme out a bit. So it's not in, as neat and tidy as Irons and Klein make out. So uh, that's the first 
concern under this exegetically inaccurate and inconsistent. Second, this idea of temporal recapitulation uh, on day four, where day four recapitulates the creation of light on day one. It's the same act of creating light just told from two different angles. That's their view. And what they argue is that <clears throat> if you read Genesis 1 and 2, there is temporal recapitulation all over. Chapter 1, 26 to 28, the creation of man, male and female, in his image. Well, chapter 2, it unpacks the creation of man, okay, male and female. Um, there is the creation of the animals in chapter 1. Well, that's mentioned again in chapter 2, verse 19. Uh, God had formed from the ground every living creature and brought the creature, the animals, to Adam. So they say there's temporal recapitulation happening throughout chapter 1 and 2. And the most obvious one is in chapter 2. If you have your Bible, you want to look down. In chapter 2, in verse 8, God put the man whom he had formed in the Garden of Eden. Chapter 2, verse 8. And then chapter 2, verse 15. Then God took the man and put him in the garden. So, did he put Adam in the garden twice? Chapter 2, verse 8 says he put him in the garden. Chapter 2, verse 15 says he put him in the garden. Right? Now, there's an example of temporal recapitulation. Right? What intervenes between those verses? Well, chapter 2, 9 uh, to 14, it's the background information about the two trees and the river that flows out of Eden that splits into four rivers and the materials that are connected to the rivers. And so as Moses is writing this, he goes off on a tangent, right? He goes into what's called background information. He goes to just tell you about the trees and the rivers and the materials. And then he jumps back onto the mainline narrative and says, let me pick up where I left off. Do you remember God put Adam in the garden? Chapter 2, verse 9. I'm going to say it again. God put Adam in the garden, right? So we pick up where I left off. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we continue with the narrative. Okay, that, that's a really good example of genuine temporal recapitulation in the narrative. But notice what there was. There was an, a tangent, right? There was an excursus. There was background information that required a temporal recapitulation, right? It required him to say again that he put Adam in the garden a second time. He only put him in the garden once, right? He's just picking up where he left off. Now, what they say is, well, that's the same with day four. Day four is a temporal recapitulation of day one. But the problem with that is, is that between day one and day four in chapter one, there is no excursus. There's no tangent. There's no background information. There's no section break like there is in chapter two. So this idea that, chapter f that day four is an example of temporal recapitulation doesn't actually hold when you look at the evidence. So they overstate their case with the temporal recapitulation uh, for day four. <clears throat> Third, Irons and Klein's argument that the word day and the phrase evening and morning function as metaphors for real units of time, just as Jesus' use of fox functions as a metaphor for a real king called Herod, this argument <clears throat> is strained and selective. It's strained in that there is no clear referent of upper register time stated in the Genesis prologue. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remember I said metaphors describe what is and what is not, but they do so in the context of a clearly named or stated referent. In the case of Jesus calling Herod a fox, the metaphor works because Herod is the obvious reference in the preceding verse. <clears throat> to draw an analogy from this to day or evening and morning in the creation narrative functioning as a metaphor falters on the simple fact that the reference of upper register time to which day and evening and morning supposedly correspond, are never named. What are these reference of day or evening and morning? What are they? We're never told. Whereas to call Herod a fox, we know who Jesus is referring to. Herod. He's been named in the context. 
But the upper register elements to which day and evening and morning supposedly correspond, they're never mentioned. And so this idea of uh, them functioning like a metaphor is, is overly strained. <clears throat> it's also selective. Irons and Klein view temporal features in the text as metaphors like day and evening and morning, but not other lower register realities like trees or the moon or fish or birds. If the literary framework in Genesis 1 is figurative as a whole, which the Irons and Klein claim is the case, why are these lower register creaturely realities not also spoken of in relation to upper register realities? What's the equivalent of the moon in the upper register? You see the point? In other words, for Irons and Klein, the metaphorical approach may be applicable to days, but not to daisies. Right? The daisies, the flowers, they don't refer to anything in the heavens. But why not? If days do, why not daisies? Okay, it's selective. And if it's selective, then it's subjective. They get to decide what's making a connection to the upper register and what isn't. Uh, which brings us back to the issue of nominalism. Do you remember they responded saying that they weren't uh, participating in a nominalist exegesis of the text? Well, what is nominalism? Nominalism teaches that things like numbers, the first day, the second day, and descriptions, things like there was evening and there was morning, that these are merely features of the way of talking about things. They do not correspond to actual reality. That's nominalism. You can use names and numbers and descriptions, but they don't correspond to anything real. Okay? Um, that's nominalism. Um, <clears throat> now, you can see why nominalism is one of the charges brought against the literary framework interpretation, where the temporal language of day and evening and morning seem to bear no true relation to the thing named or signified. Uh, a guy called Jean-Marc Berthaud, a French scholar, criticizes Henri Blochet, the other French scholar who presents the literary framework interpretation. Here's what he says in writing to him. He says, what is taking place here is in fact nominalist exegesis. For Occam, the form of the name has no real or true relation to the thing named or signified. Similarly here, the literary form of the creation week has no actual relation to the temporal reality of creation itself. I think Berthaud is onto something here. The literary framework interpretation has a sniff of Platonism about it, where we have two realms, the noumenal, the heavenly, invisible, upper register realm, and the phenomenal, the lower earthly register realm with an unbridgeable Kantian gap between them. Kant said that there, Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, said that there is a noumenal realm and a phenomenal realm and you can never bridge the two. And I think that's a, a, a charge that Irons and Klein, in a sense, have to answer. Now, they are adamant that their position does not platonize the temporal indicators into mere ideas. Here's a few quotes. Whenever lower register language is employed metaphorically for upper register realities, it communicates genuine truth about the upper register. Another quote, the upper register is a real part of the space-time creation. Thus, all upper register events recorded in scripture are real historical events. Another quote from them. This may be so, but as Irons and Klein admit, while the upper register six-day period is a real unit of time, nevertheless, they, stay, they say or they admit or concede, quote, we cannot translate it into its lower register equivalent. God has not chosen to reveal that information to us. In other words, what occurred in the noumenal ultimately remains unknowable. In their own words, we cannot translate it into its lower register equivalent. God has not chosen to reveal that information. Now, with a statement like this, Irons and Klein have so changed the specific temporal indicators in Genesis 1 into a general time reality that the ordinal numbers, first day, second day, third day, and the time periods, evening and morning, 
bear no true or real relation to the thing named or signified in the upper register. They have divested the terms of any true meaning or referential significance. And even if Irons and Klein protest to the contrary, they cannot evade the charge that they have introduced this unbridgeable gap between the noumenal, the upper register, and the phenomenal, the lower register. Yes, granted for them, the temporal indicators of Genesis 1 are no less real or less historical, and yet for all of that, they are no more knowable or discernible either. In summary, in their attempt to avoid a form of nominalism, Irons and Klein have drifted into a form of agnosticism all the while still not entirely evading the charge of nominalism. So that's the third uh, aspect of the in exegetical inaccuracy and inconsistency. The metaphorical argument doesn't hold, and the charge of nominalism it does hold. Number four. Uh, as mentioned before, Irons and Klein employ a faulty anachronistic hermeneutic to interpret Genesis 1. That is, they use a peculiar interpretation of Genesis 2, 5 to 6, and then retrospectively use it as a controlling interpretive lens for rereading Genesis 1. This is what I mean when I talk about an anachronistic hermeneutic. From the viewpoint of the reader, they are reading the Bible backwards. Okay? Now, done any theological study, you will have heard of the analogy of fide, the analogy of faith, the analogy of scripture, where scripture interprets scripture. And later scripture, Genesis 2, can interpret earlier scripture, Genesis 1. But in the analogy of fide, uh, we must also respect the progressive order of the divine revelation in history as it is inscripturated in the canonical text. The sequence of written canonical revelation matters, even if it's by the same author. And in this case, given how Moses presents the material in its final canonical form, Genesis 2 is to be read after Genesis 1. That's the way Moses ordered the material. And there's a bit of irony here for Irons and Klein because their insistence on temporal recapitulation of day four, recapitulating day one, requires what? That you read the Bible in the order in which Moses gave it to us. Temporal recapitulation requires you to read Genesis 1 first before Genesis 2. So at one point, they sort of have to read the Bible left to right instead of right to left. Uh, but here's the problem with using Genesis 2, 5 to 6 as the hermeneutical lens through which you read Genesis 1. Um, <clears throat> it is an obscure text. Genesis 2, 5 to 6 is a tricky text. I'm going to point out some features to you in a moment. Um, but the whole point of the ana analogia fide, Scripture interpreting Scripture, is that you interpret an obscure part of Scripture with a clear part of Scripture. Well, which is clear and which is obscure in Genesis 1 and 2? Well, Genesis 1 is not an obscure text. Genesis 2, 5 to 6 is quite obscure, and I'll point that out in a minute. All the tricky exegetical decisions you have to make. Well, if you take the obscure text of Genesis 2, 5 to 6 and misinterpret it, but then use it as your hermeneutical lens for Genesis chapter 1, well, now you're on very shaky ground. You've built a whole framework, okay, on a dodgy interpretation, or it depends on your peculiar interpretation. You see the problem? So the analogy of fide, scripture interpreting scripture needs some qualification. We should interpret scripture in the order in which it has been given, and we should interpret obscure texts in light of clear texts, not the other way around. Um, now, the text of Genesis 2, 5 to 6 is tricky, okay? Here are some issues. Should the bush of the field, the shrub of the field, should it be read as synonymous with the plants of the field, uh, also in verse 5, and then identified with the vegetation and plants of Genesis 1, 11? That's what Klein's and Irons do. 
Okay, so she, is, are we talking about the same plants? Okay, or should the shrub of the field, the bush of the field in 2.5, be read as a subspecies of the vegetation of Genesis 1.11, which had not yet come upon the earth because in ordinary providence, the whole idea of seeding, pollination, implantation, maturation hadn't had time to take place because it was three days, right? Day three to day six when God made man on day six. So are the, is the shrub of the field actually just a subspecies of the vegetation of day one, which had not yet had the chance to come and sprout up on the earth? There's a third option. Is the shrub of the field the weeds, the thorns and the thistles that sprout up after the fall as a result of Adam's sin, Genesis 3.18? Those are three options there, okay? And the two with most historic precedence are option two and three. Calvin goes with option two. Uh, Casuto, the Jewish commentator, goes with option three. Uh, but Irons and Klein's interpretation is actually quite peculiar in the history of interpretation to equate the shrub of the field exactly with the vegetation of chapter 1 and say they are identical and therefore we have to reverse the order of chapter 1. It's not actually how the vast majority of commentators have interpreted that. Then there's the word mist or stream, aid in the Hebrew. Uh, Kleins and iron interpret this as rain cloud. A rain cloud was going up from the earth and watering that was bringing the rain. Uh, other commentators go with the more traditional reading of stream, a mist. A stream was coming up from the earth, from the subterranean uh, river. So which is it? Uh, this is a word that only appears, I think, once here in the Hebrew, and so in the whole Old Testament. And so we have to sort of work out what we're going to do with this word. Uh, sorry, one other place it appears is in Job. So we've only got one or two places where it appears, and it's quite an obscure word. Okay. Now, well, a couple of things that can help us. Look what chapter 2, verse 5 says. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, but, uh, sorry, and there was a man to work the ground, but a mist was going up from the land. Okay. Where do rain clouds go up from? The land or the sea? You're all... Tacomaites, are you? Is that the right word? Okay, you, you know, a rain cloud comes up from the sea, not the land. Okay, the whole cycle of evaporation occurs out at sea and then the clouds come in, right? Uh, so it doesn't really make sense that it would be rain cloud. It makes more sense for it to be stream. And all the earliest translations of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, Syriac, Vulgate, they all interpret this as stream or a mist was going up from the land. It's connected to the subterranean ocean, the deep that chapter 1, verse 2 speaks about, and the river that flows out of Eden. It makes more sense to see that the earth was being irrigated by subterranean rivers, and a mist, a stream was coming up uh, from the land to water the earth before the rain cycle had had time to develop. Okay? So that's what I think the text is, is saying. Um, now, the point in all of this is simply to point out that it's tricky, and even the verb to go up, um, uh, and the mist was going up, is this mist, a uh, mist began to go up, or is it a mist was habitually going up? Well, Kleins and Iron say it's the inceptual meaning, it's uh, the, the rain cloud began to go up. Uh, whereas traditionally, most commentators would say it's habitual. It's frequentative. The stream was habitually going up from the earth and watering the earth before rain had come upon the earth. Um, so we've got three tricky exegetical issues. And all I'm trying to say is, if you take an interpretation of this verse and then use this verse, these two verses, as your hermeneutical lens, to read Genesis chapter 1. Can you see how faulty your foundation may be for how you read Genesis 1? Because what if you get something wrong in Genesis 2, 5 to 6 in your interpretation? Well, it means you're going to get Genesis 1 wrong then as well. You see? So that's another uh, problem, I think, with uh, um, the Irons and Klein 
anachronistic reading. One other point there is they're big on ordinary providence from chapter 2, verse 5 to 6, and yet they won't allow ordinary providence for subspecies of, these, of the vegetation on day 3 to develop. Okay? It just takes time. It takes ordinary providence to allow subspecies of plants to come upon the earth through the cultivation by man and through rain. And so ironically, they keep saying it's ordinary providence, ordinary providence. And I want to say, yes, ordinary providence. There was not yet subspecies of the vegetation from day three upon the earth. Why? Because it hadn't rained. And why? Because there was no man yet to cultivate the earth, to plant these subspecies. Um, and so ironically, they want to impose or in, um, enforce ordinary providence as a hermeneutical lens for chapter one, but they, in a sense, deny it in these verses in relation to the subspecies. Okay, so that was the, uh, the fourth uh, exegetical misstep or inaccuracy, I think, with um, Genesis chapter two, five to six. Number five, uh, back to the temporal recapitulation on day four with respect to day one. I think there are three problems here. The first is it's selective and inaccurate exegesis. It's a caricature and it's circular reasoning. Let me deal with each of those. Selective and inaccurate exegesis. They, they have this broad brush stroke approach that says that the light created on day one and four uh, had the same purpose to separate the light from the darkness. Remember, let there be light, and God separated the light from the darkness. Um, and then they say, well, day four, God called that good, and day four, he then replaced it with the sun. On the literal interpretation, you have to have a replacement mechanism. He creates the light on day one to separate light and day, and he thinks, well, that wasn't very good, even though I said it was good. And so on day four, I'm going to make the sun, and it's going to do the same thing. Okay? And... Uh, so they, um, they argue uh, like this. But um, what they fail to see is that there is not replacement in day four. There is development. Let me give you an example. The moon is created on day four. Now, on day one, does the light on day one that's created have anything to do with the darkness or the night? No. The light created on day one is entirely separate from the darkness. Why? Because it's created to separate light from darkness. But the moon, does the moon give light? Yes, through reflection on the, from the sun. The moon gives light. When does the moon give light? When it's dark, in the night. And so now on day four, we have a creation of a light emitter, the moon, okay, which is associated with the dark with the nighttime. It rules the nighttime. But in day one, the light had nothing to do with the darkness. And so what we have is development, not replacement. The light that's created on day four develops the light that was there on day one. Okay. Uh, another idea of development, uh, this idea of development's not foreign to the context of the narrative. On day one, water is created in the initial ex nihilo creation of the earth. Uh, there was uh, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep waters. Day one, day two, God puts an expanse between the waters and separates the waters below and the waters above. So there's development with the waters on day two. Day three, he gathers the waters and makes them into seas. And so for three days, God develops water. So why can he not develop the light from day one on day four? Okay, so in context, we have other elements that were created that are developed over, over the days of creation. And so we can do the same with the light on day one. Also, <clears throat> uh, the light on day one, uh, it's non-directional. We're not told where exactly it shines. It basically shines into the whole cosmos. But the light on day four is very specific. It's to light upon the earth. So there's another development that the light that is effused, uh, effusive, uh, pervaded through the whole of the cosmos on day one seems now to become more concentrated on the earth in day four. And then you have the stated purpose for the lights of the sun, moon, and stars on day four. They are to mark seasons, set times, 
and serve for the length of days and years. Now, such purposes are only possible from the placement of the sun, moon, and stars in the heavens. Day four, therefore, cannot be a recapitulation involving replacement of the light from day one, since on day one, there was no expanse of the heavens in which to place the sun, moon, and stars. When was the expanse of the heavens made? Day two. But day four says God made the sun, moon, and stars and put them in the expanse of the heavens. Well, the expanse of the heavens on day one hadn't been made. And you also need the creation of the expanse of the heavens in order to have climate and forecast and important events, the signs, the set times, referring to the rhythm of seasons for farming and festival occasions. They're dependent on the seas and the land mass for their occurrence or occasion. In other words, the creation of the light bodies on day four presupposes all of the creative activity on day one, two, and three in order for them to function properly on day four. But if you say that day four is a recapitulation of day one, well, then you create the sun, moon, and stars, and you've got nowhere to hang them. And to go back to Iron, Irons and Klein's point, ordinary providence. That's not ordinary providence, to try and hang the sun, moon, and stars in nothingness for a day. Okay? That's not ordinary providence. Ordinary providence would be that you put the sun, moon, and stars in an already created expanse of the sky, which occurs on day two. Okay, so you can see that their replacement uh, uh, theory mechanism, I think it's a caricature. There is no replacement, there's development. And uh, you can see that um, it's, uh, it's exegetically inaccurate and inconsistent. There, there are problems with it. Okay, this is why you all came tonight. What is the light on day one then? Okay, if day four is not a replacement light for the light on day one, or even if it was, what is the light on day one? Okay, so let me, there's a wee bit of an excursus, all right? So literal interpreters have put forward two proposals for what the light is on day one. They argue that it is either a natural um, source of light other than the sun, that's one option. Or a second option is that it is a supernatural source of light emanating from God himself. So two options. It's either a natural light other than the sun, or it is a supernatural light emanating from God himself. So let me deal with the first proposal, a natural light. This has been expressed in different ways. They say, one, some commentators will say the diffuse light of day one, it was diffused throughout the whole universe becomes concentrated in the bodies of light of the sun and moon on day four. So development. Or the lights of day four are subsets or extensions of the light of day one, and they only operate with reference to the earth below compared to throughout the whole cosmos on day one. But in either case, here's a quote from Gerhardus Voss on your handout. The sun has light but is not light. The sun has light but is not light. Uh, in either case, the light of day one, whichever way you interpret the natural light, the light of day one is viewed as somewhat distinct from that of the sun created on day four, which is not unreasonable given that modern science tells us that there is light other than the sun in our universe. So scientists today, if you'd say, if you switched off the sun, there would still be light. Okay, so we, we have this simplistic idea that the only light in the universe comes from the sun. And scientists will say that the sun itself is not actually light. It emits light, but it's not itself light. Um, now, the idea of light beyond the sun, that there is a light other than the sun, finds support actually in the book of Job, chapter 38, 19. God says to Job, where is the way to the dwelling of light? And where is the place of darkness that you may take it to its territory and that you may discern the paths to its home? Where is the way to the dwelling of light? Well, Job could say, what are you talking about? The sun there. But clearly that's not the answer, is it? God is saying to Job, there is light beyond the sun. 
and you don't know where it comes from. So even in the Bible, we have this idea of a light beyond the sun. So this brings us to the second proposal. The one option is it's a natural light that exists beyond the sun, and when the sun is made, it just concentrates that light into the sun and the moon. Um, here's the second proposal, uh, that it is a light, uh, that a supernatural light emanating from God himself. So John Calvin here with this quote, the sun and the moon supply us with light, and according to our notions, we so include this power to give light in them that if they were taken from the world, it would seem impossible for any light to remain. Therefore, the Lord, by the very order of the creation, bears witness that he holds in his hand the light which is able to impart to us without the sun and the moon. I mean, there, there's a whole sermon in that, right? We, we, we think we are so dependent on the sun for our existence and for light. And Calvin's saying, no, God could snuff them out and show us that the light comes from his hand. Now, James Jordan, he proposes that the light of Genesis 1-3 is connected with the glory spirit of Genesis 1-2. Remember the spirit hovering over the waters? Well, in the Old Testament, the spirit of God is always connected to light, to light phenomena. The spirit the pillar of fire that leads Israel out of Egypt, that's the Holy Spirit. Or the lightnings on Mount Sinai, that's God coming in his spirit on earth. Or the fiery presence at the tabernacle. All of those are manifestations of the spirit being with God, the spirit being with his people. And they are all light phenomena. And so James Jordan says, well, the light of Genesis 1, let there be light is connected to the spirit of Genesis 1-2. The spirit was hovering on the waters. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's, that's one perspective. Uh, Klein uh, dismisses the supernatural light interpretation, arguing that, quote, it distorts the eschatological design of creation history according to which the advent of God's glory is the source of illumination that does away with the need for the sun awaits the consummation. So for Klein, there is no revelation of supernatural light in the created order because we're waiting for that at the consummation. Okay? And that would sort of undercut the consummation if some of the supernatural light of God's presence was revealed in the first creation. Okay? There is no light of God in the first creation. We're waiting for it in the new heavens and the new earth. That's Klein's response. But that's certainly true that the doing away of the sun awaits the consummation, yes, but it doesn't follow that a natural light prior to the sun cannot serve as a type of that consummative light, or that a pre-glimpsed partial revelation of the eschatological light cannot serve as a type of that consummative light. Now, the sun could be a type of the eschatological light, but it's also possible for a natural or supernatural alternating light prior to the sun to be a type of the supernatural constant light beyond the sun, the light of God himself. So I think you can have a light in Genesis chapter 1, day 1, that is either a natural light beyond the sun that serves as a type of God, he himself is the light, or we see a glimpse of, uh, of God's light in day one that makes us realize that when he makes the sun on day four, we are to always look for the light beyond the sun, which is God himself. So that is my take on the light in, uh, on day one. <clears throat> okay, let me just return to Irons and Klein's um, temporal recapitulation argument. Remember, selective and inaccurate exegesis, they go for the replacement theory, when I think we can have a developmental interpretation of day four. Um, they caricature the replacement and say that you, replace, whoops, that you replace the light on day one with the light on day four, and we're saying, I'm saying, no, there's no replacement. That's a caricature. We're, we're, we're developing the light on day one, not replacing it. And to argue like the literal interpretation requires 
a replacement mechanism is a caricature. Um, and then there's also circular reasoning in their uh, argument of temporal recapitulation. For them, Genesis 2, 5 to 6 establishes that ordinary providence was at play in the creation week. But ordinary providence requires that the light source for establishing day and night for the first three days must be the sun. And therefore, they conclude that the light on days 1 to 3 must have come from the sun. But that is circular reasoning. They must assume X in order to conclude X. They must assume that ordinary providence entails sunlight for days 1 to 3 to conclude that there was sunlight on days 1 to 3. Okay? They might need to sleep on that one. Um, okay. So I think that wraps up the fifth critique concerning the argument for temporal recapitulation on day four with respect to day one. Those five points, they've come under my third point about the concern over the literary framework interpretation. We saw the first one uh, was the it's highly sophisticated. The second is it's historically peculiar and novel. The third is that it's exegetically inaccurate and inconsistent, and we've seen five parts to that third point. Tomorrow night, I will show you uh, two more critiques. I'll present two more in showing that it is logically confused and confusing, and fifth, that it bristles with contradictions and is ultimately reductio ad absurdum. If you take the literary framework to its logical conclusion, it's absurd. It, f it runs into complete and utter contradiction. And so that's what we'll do tomorrow night. Uh, and then in the fourth lecture afterwards, I will aim to be constructive after being deconstructive and uh, present you with what I think is a better way of reading the Genesis prologue. Don't go anywhere. Just uh, take 10 minutes for some questions. First, not this should be easy. Klein and Irons, alive or dead? Uh, Meredith Klein uh, passed away, I think, in the mid 2000s, 2008, maybe. Uh, Lee Irons is still uh, still here, still here with us on Earth. Yeah. All right. Okay. Liv lives out on this side of America, I believe, in California. That explains a lot. Um, <laughs> um, what are the ramifications for our faith if we should accept the literary framework view? Um, well, let me say that I don't think you go to hell if you believe literary framework interpretation. Um, I think you can hold to alternative interpretations and still go to heaven because it's the gospel that takes you to heaven, uh, not a particular view of the days of creation. But um, I say to my students at Westminster, how you interpret the first chapter of the Bible will determine, or let me put it another way, how you interpret the first chapter of the Bible reveals your disposition to scripture and will influence and determine how you will conduct your ministry for the rest of your years. Uh, I really believe these things are all connected. And so I think it, what it does is um, it makes you more open, the literary framework interpretation. If that's the way you're going to interpret the opening chapter of the Bible, it will make you more open to some idiosyncratic, in exegetically inaccurate and inconsistent interpretations of other parts of the Bible. Because in a sense, you weren't willing to sort of go with a plain, literal reading. Another um, connection to that is, I would say, and this might surprise you, I think a lot of this, this is offensive to those who hold on an alternative interpretation on the days, a lot of this comes down to whether you have a backbone or not. <laughs> and I do sort of mean that. We, in the evangelical reform world, have become far too obsessed with what the world thinks. And so we want to find an interpretation of Scripture that is a bit more palatable with what our culture will say, what the science says, uh, 
what the academy says, um, and it's all come from the Enlightenment. Since the Enlightenment, the different alternative interpretations of the days of creation have proliferated, all because of the scientific Enlightenment. We're all, we're, Christians are trying to find a way to make the Bible uh, palatable to the secular world. And once you do that with the first chapter, you're going to do it with chapter two with Adam. You really believe that we all descended from one man and one woman in Mesopotamia 6,000 years ago. Um, and then you're going to do it with something else like marriage, maybe, and gender. Uh, these things are all connected. And they can take decades, centuries, before the slip starts to happen. But it all begins back at the beginning. And so uh, I think that um, the ramifications of your hermeneutic in Genesis 1 are a bit like um, the, um, the tremors of an earthquake. We had an earthquake in Philadelphia last week, and uh, you know there's, we were feeling the tremors a bit after it. And uh, that's what happens with how you interpret different parts of Scripture. The, the ramifications continue in other parts of the Bible and for generations through the church. All right. Would you encourage or discourage people to read Klein and Irons? Are there other areas, topics, where they have insight and wisdom that we should be aware of and familiar with? Or does their understanding of the literary framework inform and damage the rest of their writings and teachings? Um, I, I wouldn't encourage people, I wouldn't discourage people from reading them. I think if you're a well-read Christian, you can read them and appreciate many things that they have to say, um, but also you would need to read other books or articles that, you know, helpfully critique this interpretation. Uh, but it's not, I don't think it's something to be avoided um, as such. Uh, there's a lot in Klein I like, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, even though I'm being critical in this lecture and the one tomorrow night. Uh, he's very helpful on a number of things, and as you'll see in my fourth lecture, Though I didn't necessarily get it from Klein, I, I actually agree with the two registers and even heavenly time and earthly time. I just think they're connected, um, that they're in lockstep with each other. So um, there are things that Klein has taught that I think are very helpful. He has a thing called an in, the intrusion ethic uh, in ethics and eschatology, which I think is very helpful. But I'll say this about Klein. He, I think he did broad brush stroke exegesis, and it all looks very neat and tidy. The days look like they match. Uh, he does it with um, the genealogy in chapter 5 and 10, 10 descendants, 10 descendants. And so he says these are not real ages. It's a literary yeah. framework for the ages of the patriarchs, these long ages. And uh, when you get into the weeds and the details, as I showed tonight, the, the, they don't match up. And it's the same, actually, with the 10 and the 10. It's not 10, it's 10 and 9, yeah. right? And it doesn't quite match. But when you first hear it, you're like, oh, yes, of course. Yeah. So I think all I would say with Klein is just be aware that he, 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 he tends to do exegesis, I think, in broad brush strokes rather than getting into the details. Did Irons and Klein have an ulterior theological motive or presupposition that kind of led them to these conclusions. Yeah, you know, some people have accused them of that, and, and I think that is unfair because they, they really, they state it very clearly in the <coughs> article they write together, and Klein states it clearly in 1958 when he writes his first article, that he says, and I, I recorded it tonight twice, purely exegetical considerations lead us to the literary framework interpretation and away from the literal <coughs> interpretation. He says, if you go with a literal interpretation, you have a head-on collision with just simple, plain logic and sense at yeah. times. And uh, he, he says, the bristling with contradiction is my little pun with yeah. Klein, because he uses that against the literal yeah. interpretation, and I'm sort of turning it around yeah. and saying, no, actually, your position bristles with contradictions. Um, so Klein, um, they are arguing... Um, that their position solely arises out of scripture. Now, I was sitting with Ken Ham one time in a meeting at the Creation Museum, Genesis, Answers in Genesis, and we were talking about how people have interpreted the days of creation, and he said to me, he made a very shrewd comment, and I, I, so far it's proved true in my research when I've looked things up. He said, 
He said, you, you look at any alternative interpretation, even the ones that say they're only doing, they're only basing it on scripture, they're only exegeting the text. He says, you'll find somewhere in a footnote or in a little parenthesis comment, you'll find somewhere where they make a little hat tip to science. And he's right. So far, I find it in a footnote or somewhere where, where the interpreters will say, and, and this means that our faith is not contrary to science, you know. And Klein, in his article, 1996, Space and Time in Genesis Cosmogony, the final footnote, footnote 47, this does not discountenance a view that can entertain the evolutionary origins of Adam. Now, interestingly, Irons and Klein, in their 2001 article, clarify, and he says, we do not have any time for the evolutionary origins of Adam. But Klein republished his 1996 article in a book in 2005, which was his last publication, and he left the footnote in on change. Yeah. And so I think that Klein actually was trying to make some concordance with science. And they both admit in the article that they are moderately concordant with science. That, you know, they, they hold that this is compatible with modern science. Um, but they, they want to say, but it's only from Scripture that it's arising. And I must say, yes, you say that, but there's that footnote. Yes, you say that, but earlier on you admit some concordance with science. So... <coughs> I think ultimately, goes back to my comment about the backbone, I, I think we're too scared of what science says and what the culture and media and the academy are going to think of us by holding what seems just such a bizarre and archaic, archaic interpretation of scripture. And yet, before the Enlightenment, it was the most dominant interpretation of Genesis, the literal interpretation. Two more, two quick ones. I think it's quick. Uh, do you see a worship element in Genesis in light of the use of the Hebrew word moedim in Genesis 1.14 and the Sabbath at the conclusion of the week? Yes, absolutely. And so you're going to hear my fourth lecture that I think the whole of creation is heading towards the worship of the triune God and even moed in chapter 1.14-18 to that God made the sun and moon stars for moed for signs, seasons, festivals. I think God is preparing the world for the worship of himself, which Leviticus picks up on and has these festivals at different times of the year, which can only be commemorated because of the sun, moon, and stars that are there. So yes, I think that worship is very much uh, going on in chapter, uh, in the Genesis prologue. Yeah. All right, and then the last one, can you briefly define cosmogony? <laughs> now you're going to get me. Cosmogony, because there's a distinction between cosmology and cosmogony. Yes. And, uh, and now you've got me, because as I was reading it out tonight, I was thinking, I hope nobody asks me. Well, you, you, I, know, you know the answer. Not, the the answer is not right on the tip. Google of it, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, there is a distinction, but it's, it's basically the cosmos. How, how, what makes up the cosmos? Cosmogony. Cosmology is the study of the cosmos, I think. Okay. All right, so there is somebody with a phone number ending 4544. I cannot read your messages. It comes as some weird things, and it's probably Chris Stanley. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> because... Huh? There's a book on the line. But I literally, it doesn't come as a message. It comes as a picture, and there's nothing showing. So I'm sorry. So tomorrow... Pen and paper, maybe, or get a better service or something. I don't know. <laughs> and then there's a couple more we'll save for tomorrow just because of time. Of these ones, which one do you like? Oh, now I've forgotten the question. The cosmogony one? No, no the last one. <laughs> uh, what was the best question? What was the first question? I, don't, I didn't ask them in the order that I received them, no. so... Oh, the first question is, are they alive or dead? No, not that one. <clears throat> what was the one after that? Uh, then I asked, um, what's the impact in life? Like, uh, um, 
uh, think, well, what are the ramifications of our faith if we should accept literary framework view? Yes, that, that one. What are the ramifications? Yes, that, I don't know if that's allowed, but it's a board member of the seminary that oh, asked that. Well, no, 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 we can't have that one. Okay, so let's give to Isaiah, who asked an, uh, another one that was really good in there. Isaiah, you get the book. Okay. All Isaiah. right, so. And it has a signature on it, so they say it's worth more on the garage sale. So. <laughs> 2.5 million. <laughs> uh, remember, we have our, our banquet tomorrow at 5.30. Welcome to come to that. And then the following lectures tomorrow night at 7 and 8. Um, thank you, Dr. Gibson, for teaching us tonight. Uh, Lord bless you and take you in peace. See you tomorrow, Lord willing.